heal all our wounds. Soothe our worries. Receive our prayers, our longings. Make us one in you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Please stand as you're able and turn towards the baptismal font. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty Creator and ever-living God, we worship you, glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. soul so weary when troubles come and my heart burden be then I am still a here in the silence until you come and say a while with me you raise me up 
so I can stand on mountains. You raised me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up. So I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up. Stand on mountains, you raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders, you raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than. I can be. You raise me up. A reading from Proverbs. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up, at the first, from the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank you. 
A reading from Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance (coughs) produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that, is, all that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. The saying goes, the higher you go, the harder you fall. And Benjamin Franklin once also said in his autobiography, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it. Mortify it as much as one pleases, it's still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Pride is a very hard vice to submit, to control. So I wonder, how could Paul write in his letter to the Romans, since we are justified by faith, we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Boasting feels so prideful, so full of oneself, an attitude that turns people off. Someone once said, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. And yet Paul encourages Christians to boast. And what he is suggesting is that we keep in mind a very fundamental distinction in full disclosure and humility. What he is suggesting to do is to be boastful not of ourselves, of what we have accomplished, but what God has accomplished, done in us, even through us, and for us. And for Paul, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is all the confidence that we need. That's what we want to boast about. Our hope depends not on what we are able to do, but on what God has already done. The resurrection is the vision of how things will turn out for all of us, 
for the world. The Christ figure is the prototype, the first model, the Alpha and the Omega, the outcome. It's the blueprint, the DNA of a fulfilled human being. It's what the Bible calls the Son of God. The Son in whom God delights and into whom we are called to reside, to grow, as Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. This enables us to see what the world cannot see just yet. That even in the, in the midst of struggle, our future is assured. And even today, we have in faith a taste of the things to come. Our confidence is in the one who is faithful. We boast in Christ for our calling is to inhabit the triune God. And from this angle, we assume a position of strength even when all we see is hardship. In a world where loss, grief, anxiety, and fear abounds, there is no shortage of people in our midst in need of reassurance. From this position, we can console and give comfort. But there is a challenge for all of us, for all Christians. And the challenge is to remain humble. And not assume an arrogant and judgmental attitude. In fact, we should ask ourselves, what makes us claim to have the spirit of discernment? What are the external signs? that we dwell in the spirit, that we are growing into the mature person of Jesus the Christ. Many Christians assume a sense of entitlement just because they are Christians. They seem to proclaim with pride, we have Jesus, the Son of the living God, what do other religions have? With that arrogant declaration, they set themselves to judge the whole world. And just because one is a non-Christian or non-believer, one is autom automatically condemned to hell. To some Christians, that dichotomy, heaven and hell, is so important. So all-consuming, it's the central thought of their life. We would do well in assuming a simpler, humbler, and non-judgmental attitude and let the Word of God be the judge. I have heard in my conversations with many people throughout my pastoral life of how they are cut off from other people, even family members, in the aftermath of a hurtful word spoken during a quarrel, a hard conversation. And pride seems to impede people to come to each other, to make the first step, pick up the phone, write that email, trying to reconnect. The tragic thing is that this may go on for years, for some people, even forever. But there is an ever, even greater tragedy, and that is the vast number of people who live that way in relation to God. See, when faith is not developed, when we do not grow in our faith, when we are left with the resources we picked up in Sunday school or confirmation class, and we never work on those and never um, continue on our faith discovery and journey, 
we, when we never build up on that foundation, sooner or later, it's not common to see how people reject the God they had learned about and encounter in their youth. Because this God that they had encountered in their youth feels so far away, so indifferent, even cruel when tragedy strikes. Sooner or later, they outgrow that God. And I don't blame them. As a matter of fact, I understand that. I want them to outgrow that God. But then I need to ask them exactly what God are we talking about? Where, what image do you have of God? How far have you come in your journey with God? Our God desires to be found. And you know what? When we find God, we find ourselves. You see, the fact is, all of us are hurt in more than one way. We all walk with our wounds, whether we are aware of them or not, whether they inform our feelings, attitudes, and behavior from the background of our consciousness, just like an operating system in the computer, or we have learned to find power in our pain. We may live in fear and with a victim mentality, in suspicion of others and with a blaming attitude, in bitter anger towards the rest of the world and even God, and with judgment and shame. If that is the case, we don't enjoy ourselves, we don't enjoy God, we don't enjoy life. And those around us notice that we make life miserable for everyone. Or, we may learn how to appreciate pain, learn from pain. Just last night I was watching a program on the Italian channel and they were talking about music. Specifically, they came to a point when they spoke about Beethoven Fifth Symphony. <clears throat> Beethoven realized that he was becoming deaf around 1790-something. By 1801, he wrote to a friend of his, saying, I am becoming deaf. Destiny is very hard for me, and I'm going to fight it. And he learned how to work with the pain of not hearing music. From that time on, when he wrote and produced the Fifth Symphony in 1808, music not only was able to draw out feelings from people, but music was given feelings. Beethoven reached that masterpiece because he was able to embrace his pain, would not bow to destiny as life was given to him. So we may learn from our pain and find solidarity in the crucified and risen one who accompanies us on our way. We learn to accept life's pain, embrace it, and work with it. Through this wisdom, we become, a, we become wounded healers and people of hope as St. Paul tells us. I believe that God's ultimate goal is for us to be reconciled to God, as St. Paul tells us. That is the central point of our faith. Be reconciled to God. Be one with God. 
and as such become ambassadors of that same reconciliation. Show to the world you are one with God, you live in God, you enjoy life. By professing in faith Jesus as our Lord, we are given a pass through grace to live in companionship with God. You see, grace is not just simply God's favor, the forgiveness of all our sin. Reconciliation with God, grace is even more than that. Grace is that intimate connection that we are allowed to have in God. It introduces us to the mystical and glorious presence of God who draws us ever closer to God's self like a gravitational force. Anglican Bishop N.T. Wright explains that grace is almost a shorthand for the presence and power of God himself. By grace, we find ourselves pulled to the center. And so today, the Gospel of John assures us that the Spirit will guide us in all truth in the future, will give us the right word at the right time to understand the wisdom that we need, the wisdom to open our mind's eye, our heart to God, to penetrate truth, reality, and see what, it, what life is all about, what truly life is. There is truth with a small t, the truth that we can fact check. And then there is truth with capital T, as in the heart, the, the heart of matter, an insight into a deeper reality. And pay attention to the word of truth rising from the inside of us. Paying attention to the promptings of the Spirit that dwells within will come easier as we make friends and become familiar with the Spirit of God in us. The assertiveness here is not the product of cerebral knowledge, but of the reassurance of a spiritual presence that resembles the comforting and grounding words that Jesus spoke when he walked this earth amongst his disciples. Dwelling in the Spirit opens us to new depths of union with all people, gives us a taste of true love, produces greater understanding, and encourages us to persevere in patience compassion and hope. It's an inner freedom that lets us see reality with new eyes. For us Christians to develop right discernments means to grow in the spirit of the word through Bible study, prayer, meditation, and the celebration of the sacraments. Next time you find yourselves in solitude sitting in prayer or walking before your God. Try the vulnerability of transparent honesty and the humility of naked simplicity and the promise of the peace that passes all understanding will be yours. Amen.
with the words of the Apostles' Creed, let us profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Joining our voices with God's people around the world, let us offer our prayers for those in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that the work of the Spirit unite us in Christ to proclaim the wonders of God. Let us pray. For the majesty of creation, the moon and stars that enlighten the night, the birds that inhabit the sky, and the fish that reside in the seas, that all creatures flourish together. Let us pray. For all levels of government, for wisdom and truth displayed in world leaders, and for international relief agencies, that God's love poured into the, our hearts extend to all people and nations. Let us pray. For the sick, that they are comforted. For the despairing, that they receive hope. For infants and children, that they be granted nurturing caretakers. And for all who cry out to God in any need, especially those who have recently lost their job. Let us pray. For all who provide fatherly care and guidance, for those estranged from family, for friends and neighbors, and for our congregation, that God's mercy serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their labors, that we cling to the hope of sharing with them the glory of God. Let us pray. Merciful God, you hear the prayers of your people even before they are spoken. We commend this and all our prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered, in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, and heaven earth of all of your glory, O Zana, holy and to be glorified, O God, who loves the human race and who always walks with us on the journey of life. Therefore, Father most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night of the Last Supper, he took bread, blessed, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, gave you thanks, and offered it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. To this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until he comes again, and we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Look with favor on the prayers of your church, and grant that by the power of the Spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son, in whose body and blood we have communion.
remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the peace of Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face and in the resurrection given them, give them the fullness of life. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray the prayer Christ himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this meal you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore. Through Jesus Christ, our, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.
People of Nativity, what is our mission? Go in peace, remember the poor. Amen.